Hello and welcome to the midweek trading session right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Here's what's coming up in the next 55 minutes. As President Tinubu clocks one year in office, we analyze his economic scorecard. I will see the pace of increase in South Africa's consumer food prices continues to slow. And all prices rise as major producers expect to keep output cuts in place. And it's great to have you join us. I'm Laddie Williams. Let's kick off uh, with the markets now, starting with the oil market. We've seen um, some uh, big moves um, up there in the oil market. Brent, $84.49 a barrel, up 0.3%. Uh, percent following um, earlier trade uh, this morning, um, $80.18, that's for WTI crude. Uh, before um, yesterday, I did report that was below the $80 level, but now we're seeing um, WTI crude above $80 um, at this time. We're going to drill down on what's driving um, sentiment in the market. To so the metals market now, we're also seeing some uh, movement there, seesaw movement. Silver still in the green following yesterday's trade, but we see gold having a pullback, 0.46%, $2,368 per ounce, and palladium um, getting lower, more uh, farther away from that $1,000 mark, $971 down, a big 1.71%. All right, let's bring in uh, Sunil Dixit now. Um, he's, uh, 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 he's the famous um, charter out there in the market, and he charts most of these prices. Um, great to have you, Sunil. Thank you. So, first of all, talk to me about key levels uh, to watch, key price levels to watch in the oil market at this time. We're seeing WTI um, getting back to that $80 level. Uh, as far as uh, WTI crude oil is concerned, uh, we are seeing that uh, WTI is uh, maintaining uh, fair stability above the crucial level of 80.50. $80.50. That is uh, an important zone because uh, if uh, we see stability maintained above this zone, uh, we can expect uh, some further spike towards uh, 82, 83, and even 85 in the coming days. But if this zone is not honored and if sellers uh, start pouring in uh, short positions, then uh, 78.50 will be the next uh, support down there. All right, let's look at the metals market now. What are you seeing for gold? $2,368, but we're seeing some pullbacks um, right there. But gold has, gold has had an incredible run from about $1,600 um, last year to about $2,300 right now. So talk to me about key levels for gold. See, we have uh, already seen a downward correction of $120, uh, $125 from the peak of 2450. Uh, in the recent past days, we have seen uh, what has uh, made a correction of uh, 2325. That's the low of 2325 from uh, 2450 high. That is very logical. And, uh, and uh, now uh, gold is uh, trading slightly uh, around uh, 23.6% uh, percent Fibonacci correction uh, at uh, 2338, 2340. And on the higher side, 2350, I'm, I'm talking about spot gold. 2350 is uh, immediate resistance. And if uh, gold finds some buyers from the down, uh, from the value zone, we can expect uh, some pullback to, uh, let's say, 2375 or even 2385. But 2395 is the crucial point that gold needs to cross on the daily closing basis for further advance. All right, Otherwise, definitely. Otherwise, uh, we are going to see a further, further decline to the next Fibonacci zone, that is 2270. And all right, all right, Sunil. Expect well, a, expect a more downside to, let's say, uh, 20, 2220 or even 2190. All right, thank you so much, uh, Sunil. We'll keep uh, watching those levels that you mentioned um, there. That's for WTI uh, oil and uh, the gold uh, market. Sunil Dixit is a research analyst at uh, SK Charting. Thank you so much. Most welcome. 
All right, so that's how uh, the markets uh, we track here. That's the oil market and the metals market are looking uh, right now. But now we're moving to another conversation um, at this time. Well, the, uh, today, exactly one year since President Tinubu uh, was sworn in and we've uh, been taking stock on the state of the economy um, under the president. Yes, Nigerians have had to deal with high inflation, high interest rates. But let's look at some of the um, economic charts um, at this time and review um, how it's uh, working out. Joining us for this conversation is Mr. Kalu uh, Aja, financial analyst. Uh, great to have you on the show. All right, so um, I, I think you might... Yeah, so uh, definitely we're, we're seeing um, a lot of moves. We've seen a lot of moves in the past um, one year, some bold reforms there uh, from the president. And uh, if we look at the market reforms, uh, we've seen the removal of energy uh, subsidy. We've seen exchange rate harmonization, uh, devaluation. Then we've seen a new recapitalization benchmark for banks, um, settling of valid $7 billion in foreign exchange um, a backlog, you know, at this time. So, uh, talk to me. How are you seeing uh, President Tinubu's uh, one year? Uh, I would say a lot of unfulfilled, should we say, promises uh, in uh, so far. I think before he came in, the big issues were right there: inflation, falling consumption, insecurity, uh, the oil uh, oil sales going down, debt. Those are the big issues in front of him, right? And the first month he was inaugurated, we saw him remove subsidies from PMS. We saw him float the Naira, even though that was a CBN. We saw the students known. So there's a lot of speed at the very initial stage, but that speed has slowed down into a, a, a slight waddle. Uh, we see a lot of reversals of policy, uh, key policy. PMS subsidies looks like it's back, even though it's not official. Inflation has not abated. Uh, we haven't pulled in any major FDI, but we're hearing FDI is leaving. The Naira is still, it's not a problem if it's weak, but it's unstable. Uh, we seem not to have an economic plan out there that we can see this is the framework of what we're trying to achieve in the next, say, quarter or 18 months. So all what we've listed there seems, looks good, uh, Ladi, but essentially the key big issues have not been fixed. Inflation, growth, consumption, that has not been fixed so far. And let, let's uh, think hypothetically now. Do you think any, any other government would have found it easier or had a better economic scorecard, you know, considering, you know, this government inherited about 22 trillion uh, debt in ways and means? Mm. I, 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 I hear you. I mean, anyone that had come in uh, out of the three leading candidates would have still had to increase fuel, remove fuel subsidies, might have floated the Naira, and would have had to face the debt. I think the difference in this case is the implementation of the policy. That's where I think the difference has been. You know, if you compare the speed this time last year with today, it's been a marked difference. The debt is not a problem if you could securitize it and grow the economy. The debt is a problem because we haven't grown the economy. The air revenues haven't come into the economy to pay off that debt. So our budget deficit is wider and our forex revenues from the sale of crude oil isn't increasing. Remittances are also not increasing. That's the problem, Ladi, that the core fundamentals of the economy, those things that drive the economy, have not improved in one year. <clears throat> we can't fix the problem, but we want to see that there's a direction towards fixing the problem. And that's where we are stuck in that when we look at the results of one year, we are not sure if the problem is being fixed or if it's just been put in an ice bucket. We are not there yet. We have no plan and we have no indication that the admission has got a plan to fix these big issues. That's really where we are. Right. Um, but, but let's look at citizens' uh, welfare at this time, you know, mm -hmm. the moves we've seen, you know, from this administration. Uh, we saw the suspension of the currency redesign uh, policy. Uh, we saw distribution yeah. of fertilizer to farmers, distribution of grains to citizens, uh, expansion of yeah. the cash transfer, you know, beneficiaries, establishment of a Nigerian education um, loan fund, you know, just to, you know, name a few uh, at this time. How have you seen all of these moves? Good policy on paper, but the pastry effect is difficult to, to grasp, right? 
fertilizer for food is still expensive. Distribution of grains, food is still expensive. Cash transfers have been suspended. Ministers have been suspended, uh, uh, um, as we hear, and all that. Educational fund, uh, it came, it went. <clears throat> now it's back in again, but has it really taken off? So not a lot has happened there. I like the new consumer um, credit policy, consumer scheme that we want to start. I like that a lot. Uh, if we can get that up and running, <clears throat> we can try to affect consumption in the economy. I um, also like the fact that we are maybe spending some money to distribute grains and all that to the uh, Nigerian population directly. It's increasing the cost of food, but we have to do it right. But again, Ladi, the, the story is just that we've had lots of great policies on paper, but I think where the administration has been let down is it the implementation of what it wants to do. It seems to have an idea of what it wants to do, but it hasn't done them uh, properly. That's where um, I would maybe fault them a bit. Um, we can do more. We can move further. Look at the customs duty. Uh, look at the VAT. There's a lot of taxes on the Nigerian household right now that we could take off, but we're not taking off. We could make customs duty 500 to 1. Nothing stops us from doing that. And that's a direct um, cash um, stimulus to all Nigerian households. We haven't done that. We're not being innovative or moving fast enough. That's just my take, uh, Ladi. Right. Uh, what would you say are the bright spots in President Tinubu's uh, administration. I, I remember um, how the stock market rallied to levels not seen before. Yeah. It, it was tagged Tinubu. So uh, tell me about the bright spots you've seen. Yeah, again, like you said, stock market has been up. Uh, I think the stock market is an asset class. If you buy the index, it's actually beating inflation, which is major when you consider inflation is about 33%. So that's a good, good, good bright spot there. Has it brought money to Nigeria? Yes, we've seen a lot of Nigerians bringing money in to invest in Nigerian stock market and also in fixed income securities. But the bad side is that they are doing that because rates are very, very high. Again, I like the consumer credit scheme that we want to start. I like that a lot. I also like that he has sort of allowed the CBN to take over the um, FX management policy from the NNPC. So streamline those FX flows that we're no longer having to go through NNPC, the NNPC reports. Now we're starting to the CBN. I also like the way the CBN has maybe done more of the monetary banking, try to go back to traditional banking um, as it were. Uh, those things are pretty good, and I think they, we've gotten a bit of, 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 of clarity there in terms of policy. Those are the, the, the things we can say, yes, um, they are doing right, yeah, more or less. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's um, dovetail into uh, central banking uh, at this time. We know there are some proposals um, to amend the 2007 uh, CBN Act, you know, at this time. Talk to yeah. me about what you expect, you know, from this. I'm not sure what they want to do, but the rumors I'm hearing, they want to maybe take the CBN back on the Ministry of Finance. That's a no-no. Once we do that, it's all over, right? Because then, of course, we're going to get sanctioned because CBN no longer is, quote-unquote, independent. So I'm not sure what they want to touch. It's being kept under wraps for now. But we both want to emphasize that the central bank has got to remain independent. There's a reason why it's independent, especially with what we saw in the last CBM where we were basically securitizing our ways and means and basically open up the ways and means to just become an ATM for the administration. So any reforms that strengthen independence is needed. Any reforms that take the CBN back under the Ministry of Finance is, of course, not needed. It's an unnecessary distraction. It's going to be an own goal, and it's going to basically take us back. So let's look forward to how we can strengthen independence, strengthen monitoring and governance of the Central Bank of Nigeria, and not take it back. Yeah. Right, not take it back. Well, what's your outlook for the next coming years under President um, Tinubu, and what should this government be doing now to get some kind of soft landing uh, for the Nigerian economy uh, before the fourth year? They've got to go after things that matter to Nigerians, the real things that matter. We're talking about inflation, food inflation. Food has got to be cheaper. You can't build economy around expensive food. So if you can get food cheaper, the Nigerians can start to listen to you and they can start to listen to your government's policies. So whatever it takes, if it's going to take importing food, if it's going to take subsidizing the, the import duties, the customs charges, food has got to come down to manageable levels. Once you get food out of the way, you can just start talk about quick win infrastructure projects, not the long, large ones, but the very, very quick wins. Fix all the roads, get the portals out of the way, you know, the very, very quick ones. All the schools in Nigeria, 
see if you can fix them with local labor. So you are creating jobs, you are boosting um, uh, the human development index in those states and local government areas. I mean, very, very local, uh, consumptive, you know, stimulative activities at the local level that people can see, feel immediately. That's what they have to do in the next 12 months before we then talk about, okay, how can the macro side of the national economy then start to take place? They've left the micro and gone for the macro. And the micro guys are the ones screaming that we're hungry and they had to reverse all the policies to go back and say we're going to do palliatives, we're going to do students loan and all that. So you've got to really focus on what people want. People want cheap food, people want security, people want certainty. Before you even talk about power supply, you know, food is just too expensive, bloody. So that's just what I would say. Do the micro first before you even go to the macro. That's really what people are, are, are clamoring for. Take care of the, ma the micro uh, before uh, taking care of macro at this time. That's the advice there. Thank you so much. It was great having you, Mr. Kalu Aja, financial uh, analyst. Thank you so much. Thank you, lady. My pleasure. Welcome back. Well, let's head straight to the markets now. And um, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, this week, about two days of uh, positive trade. Oh, yes, Larry. I, I didn't see that coming. Of course. That's for the local of course. boss. Of course. We did have, you know, this um, analyst saying that we are pos um, investors are positioning for half-year earnings. Right. But I know that there must be something that is giving a kick to the market. But we're going to be finding out, probably coming out in the coming days, why investors are still bullish on the NGX right now, where we have yields in the fixed income space skyrocketing, probably getting to, you know, not above inflation, but at least making good returns for, you know, investors' money. Because right now, no one wants to risk their funds, their capital. They want it to be protected. And that's the only safe haven where they can still get, you know, right. uh, great and, returns. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Abdurashid Mama did mention that a key level that he's watching uh, for the all share index. If that level breaks, then there's possibility we're going back to 100,000. Definitely. Uh, for the, all the market, index. there's still promise for the NGX. It's not given its best yet, and I'm sure we'll, Let's see if the we'll correction pop is that over. champagne, Lavi. Let's see. <laughs> so we'll just kick off, as always, with major equities in Africa where sentiments were mostly negative at intraday. Nigeria was the only outlier there. We saw a 0.27% uptick for that market still at 98,000 level. And news coming in uh, shows Nigeria's Dangote refinery is aiming for dual listing on the Nigerian and London stock exchanges. That's really great news. We'll keep our eyes and follow that development. Now South Africa's JSC was down at intraday 0.44%. It's still at 78,000 level. Elsewhere we see Egypt's EGX also down at intraday today, 0.78% and uh, back to 26,000 level. And we see Kenya stock market rallying in yesterday's trading session and closing up 2.3%. Uh, that's a big one for that market. Guess the shilling is doing well. But let's look at what's driving intraday activities at the unlisted equities market. That's the NESD. And joining us is Mrs. Davina Adeni, Executive Director. I did hear that uh, uh, Mrs. Dan uh, Davina is not ready yet, but we'll just keep going with what's happening in the market. But let's check out quickly what's happening in the Middle East and see what's happening there. The Abu Dhabi index, we see it's mostly negative for that region. The regions, the markets, major markets we track there. Abu Dhabi is down 0.03%, and Dubai is down 0.88%. And uh, we've seen that Dubai stocks was weighed down by losses in most of the sectors there. And let's look at the other areas in that place. We see the Tata wool in Saudi Arabia is up 0.54%. And we see Qatar down 1.04%. And this was due to pressure by 1.7% drop in the Qatar Islamic Bank and a 3.1% loss in United Development. Let's move on to the U.S. markets where stock futures were lower on Wednesday after the Nasdaq Composite rose to a fresh record. Future side to the Dow Jones, we see it. However, it's in negative territory, 0.59%. Uh, S&P futures down also 0.63%. And the Nasdaq futures also lost 0.69%. Now, news coming out, we're seeing fresh outs from today. Conoco Phillips has agreed to buy Marathon Oil in an all-stock uh, transaction worth $17.1 billion, and that will strengthen the company's shell assets. Also, the company says this acquisition uh, of Marathon Oil further deepens their portfolio and fits within their financial framework. While that is still cooking, well, let's find out how the markets performed 
Tuesday with Maria Bird. The U.S. stock market was mixed on Tuesday as the Dow Jones was down to 0.55 percent. The S&P 500 was barely above flatline at 0.02 percent. And the heavy tech Nasdaq showed some major gains, some of the highest we've seen in the past few weeks, at 0.59 percent. This is mostly due to the darling AI industry and the company NVIDIA, as it showed shares that closed at over $1,100 per share. This has many investors hopeful about the AI industry, but a big concern that we might not see interest rate cuts anytime soon. Thank you, Maria. We head to Asia now, where markets mostly lower on Wednesday as investors assess Australia's inflation numbers for April and consumer confidence data from Japan. We've seen Japan's Nikkei 225 falling 0.77% to 38,556 points and the index reverse course from the positive open it had in uh, Tuesday's trading session and Japan's consumer confidence, as I mentioned, has fallen in May with most households expecting higher prices. Now, South Korea's KOSPI fell 1.67% and closed at 2,677 points. The Hang Seng uh, Index in uh, China was down 1.83%. That's a massive one. And we see in the KOSPI, uh, the KOSPI, if I want to talk about it, was dragged down by Samsung Electronics, one of, you know, as it, one of the unions announced a strike. So I did mention the Yang Seng is down 1.83%. Let's look at mainland China. It's the only outlier in that region, though with a marginal uptake. We see 0.05% up for that uh, stock, for that index. And then we see Australia down 1.3%. And uh, we've seen inflation coming out from that um, that region, 3.6% it rose, and that has dampened uh, sentiments in that region. And then we, we've seen, uh, the, after that announcement, analysts are saying that with one more bad inflation report, the hopes of a rate cut may be out the window. Uh, Ladi, so it's inflation coming to dampen, you know, spirits here. Right. Or while we're looking at the world and the, the tracking of, um, of inflation, U.S. inflation, people waiting for rate cuts, and we've seen most uh, financial institutions pushing back the rate cuts because they did expect that. I think Goldman Sachs had mentioned that they want, they thought it was going to be in July now for U.S. inflation. Any rate cut expectation will probably be pushed back to September. So because we're seeing, looking at inflation, it's not coming down, it's not reaching that peak that they're looking at. So I'm just wondering, when do you think we're going to see that, you know, downtrend for inflation, especially it's affecting us in Nigeria but, but I, here? I, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm quite jealous of the U.K., you know, at this point, and the U.S., you know, because we're seeing, you know, inflation nearing their targets, you know, at this point. But I can't say the same, you know, for uh, Nigeria at this point. Our target is still far away, but I believe we'll get there you okay. know, at some point. Now, so speaking of Nigeria, we do have my guest still uh, online about to give us what's happening, especially we're cele celebrating Democracy Day in Nigeria, and we also want to see how the capital market has performed under Tinobu's watch. So we're going to be bringing on Mrs. Davina uh, Adeni. She's the CEO that's, and also the Executive Director of Best Worth Assets and Trust Limited. Good afternoon, ma'am. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. And happy Democracy Day. Happy Democracy Day to you. It's a big day today. It's a big deal for the country. Uh, we celebrate this one year. Marking one year in office. And what better way to assess is performance in one way in one year than checking in on the capital market. How would you say the market has fared under Tinubu, especially with businesses facing high cost of borrowing, high cost of importation, and FX liquidity uh, tightness? Okay, well, um, I would say that um, right after um, the immediate takeoff of this particular regime at the beginning, um, there appeared to have been um, a very positive effects of some of the policies that were taken off under this um, new regime at the beginning, basically because um, some of the policies were, were positively um, 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 interpreted in the market. First, you had a situation where they announced um, merging of um, the forex markets, and then there was a subsidy removal. And then, of course, there was proper pricing of the power sector. And then, of course, that immediately had a positive effect on the equity market. 
um, and the exchanges immediately started interpreting and the market was booming. Um, more investors were coming in, both Nigerians in diaspora, local investors, everybody was happy that there was a, a positive effect based on the policies. But however, we now notice that towards the middle of um, maybe after about six months or thereabouts, there appeared to have been a kind of slowdown in the interpretation and, of course, the reaction of investors. Negative in the sense that we we'll notice that some of the monetary policies had a negative um, um, effect on the, on the pricing. For example, you find a situation where because of the fact that um, there was uh, a new uh, monetary uh, policy um, in, introduced, you find out that, yes, in fact, the policy was supposed to have positively um, had a, a, a kind of um, immediate slowdown on the um, inflation rate. But however, we then noticed that because of some of those announcements, there appeared to have been a shift of investment from the equity into the fixed income market. Of course, those monetary policies had a way of increasing the um, interest rate, treasury bills, bonds, every one of them you know, kept on um, increasing. You, you had increase from about 10% um, what when it started, when the regime started, to what it is today. We are looking at almost 20% um, um, interest rates in the fixed income. Of course, that would naturally affect the equities. So we find all the funds moving away from the equity market into the fixed income. However, we would not say that it totally had a, an all negative effect on the capital market because, of course, you find a situation where our capital market has two windows. We have the window for equity and then we have the in window for fixed income. For example, even in our own market, you have windows where you could trade your fixed income transactions. However, the equity aspect of the capital market, you know, has been negatively, I would say, I mean, um, affected. Now we're running right. out of time, but before I let you go, could you just tell us what stocks investors at the NESD are trading right now? Okay, well, um, at the NESD, we have one of the best and the most um, um, sought for is the Aradel. Next, you have the Central Securities clearing system stock, and then, of course, the uh, NESD itself. And then, of course, you have stocks like um, Wamco, and then, but most um, highly sought for is the Aradel. And, of course, you find a situation where, of course, because Aradel price has been on the increase, ever booming and ever increasing, investors have this very strong appetite for Aradel at the moment. Very interesting there. We've seen Aradel move from about 197 naira at the start of the year to about over 4,000 naira at the close of yesterday. It's been astron astronomical, that pace it's been moving. And, we'll, and it also had plans to list on the NGX. We'll see how that plays out for investors and how they want to manage all that. But we'll, we'll keep watch. Thank you so much, Mrs. Davina Dini, uh, Executive Director of uh, Passwords. Assets and Welcome. Trust Limited. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank so, you for having me. Laddie, Aradel is a right. place to go. Well, uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, right. telling you where to go, but yeah. Aradel. Because is a place I, I'm to go. the kind of investor that would not like to buy <laughs> yeah. at a high. Definitely, <laughs> Definitely not. Thank you so much, uh, Will, for the details um, there and those uh, markets we track. But let's take it on to um, London now. We have Juliana join us from our London studio. Uh, great to have you, Juliana. So we see uh, Royal Mail, they've agreed to a 3.5 billion pound takeover, and it's a Czech uh, billionaire. Good afternoon, Laddie. That's right. It's quite an important development, actually, because as uh, many of our viewers will know, Royal Mail has been the fabric of UK society, UK business for more than a century now. But they have been um, in a swathe of issues that was started during the pandemic. And I believe this is what's led to the International Distribution Service, or IDS, that's the parent company 
of Royal Mail to agreeing this £3.4 billion pound takeover, which has been accepted by, as you said, the Czech billionaire Daniel Kretinsky. You've got to say uh, the deal is still subject to national scrutiny, as it would be. And of course, shareholders will have to agree to the takeover when I think they next meet in September. But then, you know, does this spell the end of, as I said, a stalwart of British business? I think some of the issues that Royal Mail have had, as I said, began during the pandemic because, of course, consumer options, shall we say, changed, of course. We know lots of people, were, of course, were staying at home. We started seeing um, the likes of Amazon take over um, what was the traditional way of purchasing items on the high street. And Royal Mail was suffering because people no longer send letters, do they? Most people send emails. So they tried to go into the parcel delivery service, which their competitors were doing so well in, but they just weren't unable to compete. And then, of course, we had the winter of discontent, which began in sort of late December 2022, and they were significantly impacted. I believe there were several days when Royal Mail staff um, hit the picket lines because they were not happy um, with pay from bosses. Um, so unions, as to be expected, have reacted to this takeover. They're hoping that perhaps there will be um, some decent changes at the top so that their workers can receive um, sufficient pay, wages and benefits better working conditions. But as I said, the deal is subject to conditions. First of all, it's got to go through the national security, which I believe is going to be overseen by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, if he is still the Chancellor come July the 5th. We are in full swing of uh, campaign. Uh, but then also, according to some of the details of the deal, there are some conditions such as the fact that um, Royal Mail will still be domiciled in the UK, also the branding and the headquarters, they want it to remain in the UK and they want the intellectual property to retain its look for at least the next five years. So yeah, big, big story um, out of um, the city this morning, but still subject to AGM approval, which I believe is happening in September. All right, we'll, we'll definitely keep tracking that deal. But let's look at energy prices. It was all about energy prices in 2022, uh, 2023, and even, you know, right now. But we're, we're seeing um, uh, data from RAC. They say the UK has the most expensive diesel in Europe as uh, retailer uh, margins uh, are remaining above uh, average at this time. And I, I believe in Nigeria, we're, we're around uh, 1,100 naira to 1,200 naira. But well, I'll let you be the judge of that <laughs> between uh, the UK and Nigeria, talking about diesel. Yeah, it's quite interesting, actually. I did catch a little bit of your conversation with Will about the UK and Nigeria. I suppose we'll save that debate uh, for another day. But really interesting data, as you say. Um, it's been reported by the ROC, but the data has actually been compiled um, by the European Commission and the UK Competition and Markets Authority. And alas, it shows that it is more expensive to buy diesel in the UK than it is anywhere else in Europe. I think it's five pence less per litre in Belgium and Ireland, who come pretty close at the top at second and third. And, um, of course, as to be expected, motorists are not happy about this. We are talking about diesel. Yes, of course, most motorists in the UK uh, drive a petrol car, but there are about 11.1 million diesel vehicles on the road in the the UK. And of course, we know that commercial vehicles are those who are delivering items for shops, let's say. All of them are powered by diesel. So this actually is a much bigger story, particularly as we are still going through a cost of living crisis. Yes, we have seen energy prices fall, but it is still really difficult for people. So I don't think households are going to be too happy with this announcement. The good thing is the Digital Markets and Competition and Consumer Act that comes into law on Friday. Um, so we've been promised uh, by the competition watchdog that they are going to be looking at these prices to ensure that retailers can start trickling down some of these wholesale price cuts that they're seeing. Um, to the petrol pump, um, we have heard a response 
uh, about the data from independent um, petrol court uh, retailers. And they say, look, it's really difficult for us to pass down these costs to the consumer because we've got elevated business rates, interest rates, as we know, are still elevated. And as we've seen from the UK labour market, that wage growth is still there. So they're, they say they're justified in the reasons why. Um, it costs so much more. But let's see if the new law on Friday does change things around at the petrol pump. Right, we'll definitely be looking out for that. But how are the markets um, looking in the UK at intraday? Yeah, red is the colour of the FTSE at intraday as we wait for that all-important quarterly reshuffle from the London Stock Exchange. We're hearing that Ocado, which is the online uh, grocery delivery, could be out. Their share price has dipped significantly since some of the highs they witnessed um, during the pandemic. But let's have a closer look at the numbers. The all-shares down is down by 0.36% at intraday. The FTSE 100 down to at 0.31%. And the FTSE 250, laddie, the domestic market, that's down by 0. 6-0%. In the currencies market, the British pound is trading down to, down against the US dollar by 0.06%, though up against the euro by 0.02%, but down against the Japanese yen by 0.07% at intraday, laddie. Right, I guess um, red is the colour uh, at intraday in the UK. Thank you so much uh, for the update, Juliana. Thank All right, you. let's take it on to uh, Europe now. We see, um, we know Germany is an export-driven economy and, and the sector seems to be doing a bit better. That's according to the latest data out of uh, Frankfurt. Well, Lars Holter, as with DW and has the details. Uh, great to have you, Lars. So what can you tell us about um, how German trade has been going lately? Thanks for having me, Ladi. Uh, well, here's a number that gets us all excited. Point three, that's the latest reading of the export optimism in German companies. And many economists are quite happy about that number, even though a point three certainly doesn't sound very strong per se. But the last reading of that index showed a negative 1.5. So we are indeed seeing a huge improvement in how exporting companies are viewing their business in the near future. However, and that's kind of obvious if we're looking at that real honest, Point three also means that statements about positive or a negative outlook for all those companies almost equal each other out. So even though we're seeing an improvement, the German economy built and absolutely banking on export, uh, exports isn't doing that great yet. So, so what's the story behind the numbers here? Where do we see some you know, optimism and uh, where is it lacking? Yes, it's interesting to see what businesses are on top of the list here. German drink manufacturers, and that includes breweries, have seen some stronger sales recently, and they seem to hope for strong business abroad during the summer months. Also strong furniture or glass and ceramic. Now, most of that, of course, isn't for decorative purposes, but we're talking about glass and ceramic for industrial use here. Now, I'm afraid it's more important to look at who's not doing that well yet, and that is the auto industry. According to this latest survey, uh, car executives are not yet seeing much of an improvement. But how could they? German uh, car manufacturers uh, have seen steep drops over the past few years as other countries have been quicker in switching uh, towards electric vehicles. So I don't see how this would improve for German companies anytime soon. Also a bit weak still, clothes and textiles. So some of the major industries that usually export are still looking a little lackluster. All right, so what are investors looking at in Europe today? Well, there's some numbers out from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And since we're talking about trade anyway, it's interesting to have a look at everyone's biggest trading partner, China. The IMF says that the Chinese economy is set to grow 5% this year after a strong first quarter. So that's a bit stronger, actually, than previously expected. Staying here in Europe, however, we're also getting some fresh data later in the day, including consumer confidence. Meanwhile, in the US, so that again is later in the day, we're getting another economic reading from the Fed and also some quarterly numbers, including Hewlett-Packard. All right, Lars Halter, thank you so much uh, for the details right there in Europe. Thank you. All right, let's take it to uh, North Africa now. See, in Egypt, the government has uh, devised a plan to gradually lift electricity subsidies within four years. The state has drawn up a plan to gradually um, lift subsidies on fuel and petroleum products by the end of 2025. Uh, while also indicating that diesel 
uh, will be outside the plan to remove um, subsidies. The government has assured the increase will be um, little and will not impact citizens. We know how Egyptians react um, to increase in bread prices. We'll definitely be watching out for that. Well, in, in South Sudan, um, they're seeking a $250 million loan from the International Monetary Fund to stimulate economic growth. Speaking at the African Development Bank's um, annual meetings in Nairobi, South Sudan's central bank um, governor said the young nation is urgently in need of securing this alternative financial support. All right, let's get a check on the crypto market now. And um, let's look at the screen at this point. We see it's um, red, 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 red. Um, that's how the screen is looking, predominantly red with a uh, few pockets of green. And we see the, um, the meme coins there um, still looking quite good. Sheep, that's uh, one of the leaders when it comes to the meme um, markets at this time. And uh, definitely Bitcoin pullback still happening um, right now. Let's look at some top headlines in the crypto space uh, today. And we've seen the... Uh, Shib, that's uh, Shiba Inu, that's one of the meme coins that's overtaking Cardano, that's uh, on coin uh, market cap. So we're seeing the meme coins getting a lot of attention, you know, uh, last year and into um, this year. Then we see the FTX, a former um, executive, he's uh, been jailed for about seven years for his role in the collapse of the cryptocurrency exchange, that's um, FTX. Uh, we know Sam Bankman-Fried has his issues at this time. Uh, XRP Whale has moved 50 million coins at uh, 52 cents on the on-chain transaction. Um, that's a tracking tool um, showing that he moved 50 million tokens. And definitely, when this, uh, this amount of coins are moved in this market, investors get a little jittery at this point, wondering where it's going to go. Is it going to be a sell-off? So let's bring in roommate Dominic, Deputy Managing Director at uh, Aviat uh, Industries and a founder at Vorum. He's joining me right here in the studio um, great to have you, uh, Rumor, again. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Glad so you. a lot is playing out in this market, you know, at this time. And I guess everyone's also wondering about the Ethereum spot ETF. We know what happened with Bitcoin, you know, with the Bitcoin spot ETF. But now, Ethereum is having its own uh, day in the sun. What are you <laughs> expecting at this point? Well, five months ago, Kick started a beautiful thing for us in the crypto industry. You know, in January, we saw the Bitcoin ETF being approved, and a lot of investors were excited because that actually saw a huge surge in the price of Bitcoin. And for the first time ever, we see Bitcoin hit its all-time high, even before the halving event occurred. And that has been a historical time-breaking event for Bitcoin. We've seen Bitcoin, um, the Ethereum ETF, just been approved a few days ago, and a lot. It came to us by surprise because we were not expecting. Because I was it. wondering, that was anybody expecting this at this point? And you can see that after that, you can see Ethereum jumped up from about three thousand one hundred dollars to the current price of three thousand eight hundred dollars, and that repetition of price surge has happened again in the market. Truly, this is. A, let's say Christmas came early for a lot of cryptocurrency right. investors, and we're very positive that this would see that a lot of altcoins also start going up. Because, as you know, the Ethereum layer is one of the layers that houses a lot of cryptocurrencies, especially for the altcoins. And whenever the Ethereum dominance goes up, altcoins starts going up. And this will definitely see that a lot of money is coming into the Ethereum ecosystem. However, it also gets us to a very significant transition that the SEC and the regulatory environment in the U.S. is truly getting better. Well, quite, quite interesting because I know um, Gary Gensel wasn't a big fan of Ethereum. <laughs> he did say Ethereum uh, was a security, but I guess that debate is still, you know, ongoing at this time. But we know the Bitcoin halving, miners get um, half, you know, yes. of rewards, you know, when yes. they, you know, mine a block. Yes. So I'm wondering, Ethereum, that's the same thing that's going to happen with the miners there. They're going to have that, you know, reward half. For the, for the Ethereum half, do you know the issuance of the Ethereum ETF is different from, let's say, Ethereum is having a, a, a half in. For Ethereum, one of the things that happens is that there's a bond mechanism for the Ethereum um, cryptocurrency. And that particular bond mechanism sees that the Ethereum, as it is being spent, is dissipated out of the ecosystem uh, gradually, gradually, gradually. Just like it is with cryptocurrencies like Shiba as well. Right, it's quite interesting because you wonder, you know, such a valuable currency is being, you know, burnt, you know, when a transaction, you know, is minted. That's talking about Ethereum. So I'm wondering what's going to happen in maybe 10 years. What's going to happen to 
How many Ethereum coins are going to be available if they keep burning, you know, at this rate? You know, this burn thing, it comes from a fundamental um, principle that is with cryptocurrency. How are cryptocurrencies being produced? You know, with cryptocurrencies, there is a phenomenon of the proof of work and the proof of stake. For cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, we have those cryptocurrencies being produced based on the proof of work um, algorithm. For the Cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, then there's a proof of stake algorithm. Now, the difference is this, for the proof of work, work is really is done, mathematical calculations are done on a minute basis for one block of that cryptocurrency to be produced. Meanwhile, for the proof of stake, the developers program this cryptocurrency beforehand, and then all of that cryptocurrency is launched into the market. Now, when this cryptocurrency is launched at the whole total supply available in the market, then the development team now has to come back to the drawing board and say, how can we make this cryptocurrency to be extremely valuable and scarce? And in bit to be able to make the cryptocurrency to be extremely valuable and scarce, it has to now undergo a mechanism called a bond mechanism, where some of those cryptocurrencies are sent to a wallet address that can never be accessed. It happened with cryptocurrencies like BNB, and you can see the price of BNB has surged from a few cents, which is about 0.5 cents, currently today about $600. It has happened with cryptocurrencies now like Ethereum, and it's going to continue happening in this ecosystem. Now, that burn mechanism does keep uh, playing a big role when it comes to cryptocurrency. But how do you trade this narrative? Now, talking about the um, Ethereum spot um, ETF, it's been approved, you know, at this time. So I guess it's uh, sell the news. <laughs> Truly, it is not sell the news. You see, over the last um, century, decades, whenever an ETF is being approved, we've seen a rush of money into that ecosystem. It has happened with things like gold before. Now we are also seeing this happen with digital currencies like Bitcoin. And if you notice, with digital currencies like Bitcoin, we have had over 414 investors holding the Bitcoin ETF as of today, which has never happened before. I mean, at most, it should be just maybe 30 investors. But we've seen an astonishing number of over 414 investors which means that a lot of capital is flowing into that ecosystem. And you know, just like in the words of Cathy Woods, the ARK Invest um, CEO. Oh, she's she, still bullish on Bitcoin <laughs> at this rate. Yes, she's extremely bullish. And she said that if the money that is available in other sectors go into Bitcoin, we could possibly see Bitcoin, that, and then the market capitalization of Bitcoin continues to go up the way it is going, just like we have seen over 40 billion being added to Ethereum market cap in the last few days. We could see Bitcoin at an astonishing price of $2.1 million before the end of the year. Quite incredible, quite incredible. I can't even wrap my, hand, my head around that <laughs> price, uh, uh, definitely. But you know, we've seen you know, Bitcoin top silver yes. you know, by market cap. And I'm wondering, I'm gonna check where it is you know, at this time, but it, it seems it's gonna keep climbing you know, going forward. But let's talk about this um, uh, like Shiba Inu now, hmm. you know, overtaking the likes of Cardano. These are coins that are supposed to have utility. They're supposed to be real, you know, crypto projects, you know, at this time. Yes. But we're seeing the meme coins that are supposed to be a joke, you know, climbing, you know, above these um, um, coins. So I'm wondering, is the narrative to uh, abandon the real projects and just go over the jokes at this point in this crypto industry? Well, it's a critical war of meme coin versus utility projects. And we have the people that are tapping every day, you know, <laughs> tapping their phones. Yeah, swap, to, yeah, yeah, bonk swap, and a couple of swap. You know, one of my um, very good colleague in the industry was trending a few days ago that he made over nine million naira from one of the bonk swap and note coin. And you see, this is actually benefiting some Nigerians. And this type of um, craze into the market should signify to you that truly the bull run has already kick-started, right? right? And, but let's come back to the real issue on ground, which is the fact that Shiba Inu topped Cardano, which has high level of utility, a meme coin topping a utility project. This critical war is because of the season we are in. You know, for the beginning of this bull run season, especially this 2024, we've seen a lot of meme coins top the ecosystem. Right. Meme coins like Pepe. I, I think Pepe also just did um, a 16% increase over the last few days. Right. So it has really been a season where meme coin has been. So a lot of the investors have been pivoting to the meme coin ecosystem. However, it is important to note that there are fundamentals behind the Shiba Inu project that is happening now. Number one, 
There is a bond mechanism going on with the Shiba Inu project, and they are developing their layer two scaling solution, which is Shibarium. And because of the community that is also driving the Shiba Inu ecosystem, we have also seen that they've taken a spot. I think they are now above 10th place in the coin market capitalization right. table. And this is the real underlying factor that has made them to top Cardano in the market. Quite chart. interesting. So much incredible things keep happening in this market. Thank you so much. It was great to have you, Rume. Um, Dominic, uh, Deputy Managing Director at Aviat Industries. Thank you for having Founder me. Founder Warren, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so yeah, that, that's how uh, the markets are looking, and, and definitely um, the markets are not looking so bad today. We're watching out if we can get some kind of green close again, that's for the local boss and maybe a positive week because I've been reporting negative weeks uh, uh, so far. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can visit ChannelCV.com for more updates. I'm Laddie Williams from me and the team right here at Channels HU. It's bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>